Hello, everybody. I'm Mike. Uh, I work for IBM Research. This is James here. He'll help me if I'll get stuck somewhere. Uh, and we are going to talk about using uh, MMU and restricted address spaces uh, for the container security. As, as you know, obviously, uh, container images are now the standard way to deploy applications uh, in the cloud and uh, on-prem data centers, uh, particularly everywhere. Uh, Docker image is the most convenient form of uh, distribution of uh, complex applications. And yet the container runtimes uh, do not uh, usually run natively on the bare metal machines. Uh, people uh, run the container runtimes inside virtual machines uh, because uh, virtual machines are perceived as more secure than containers and uh, it people consider virtual machines providing better isolation than container can provide. We'd like to mitigate this uh, problem and uh, to get it to the point where uh, containers uh, are as secure as virtual machine or even more secure. And uh, we are working on providing hardware isolation for containers as well as for virtual machines. So things, uh, containers do not have any particular hardware to support their execution, like uh, VMX and so on. Uh, we are using MMU to implement uh, address space isolation for containers, uh, because MMU essentially is one of the best isolation methods since like forever. And uh, we are trying to use uh, different page tables to create uh, uh, visibility of different uh, areas of uh, memory uh, so that will be, they will be isolated one from each other. One of the major points of, uh, that considers the container vulnerability is a shared uh, address space with the rest of the system. So uh, essentially any vulnerability in the kernel may lead to data exposure or to privilege escalation for uh, to get uh, access to other people's containers to uh, to to get access to other people's containers, and uh, a malicious container can get the control of the entire system. Uh, and uh, since uh, the major isolation mechanism for containers uh, in the logical sense uh, are the namespace Linux namespaces. What we are trying to do is to assign a restricted address space uh, for certain Linux namespaces so that uh, processes that run in a namespace will uh, be isolated from the rest of the system. It's anyway happens this way that uh, most, project, most objects in a namespace are already private and only used by the kernel code that uh, executes uh, on behalf of processes uh, running in that namespaces. So the idea is to provide the per namespace address space to improve uh, isolation of containers. Uh, the private objects will be mapped exclusively in that uh, address space. And uh, if a malicious container gets uh, control over the host, it still won't be able to exfiltrate data from other containers. Uh, to prevent multiple additional context switches, the processes they run, that run in the same namespace will share the same uh, page tables, will share the same address space, and uh, so uh, the context switch will become uh, more or less implicit, so whenever the process is scheduled on the CPU, uh, the page tables that's common to every process in the namespace will will get run on a, will get visible on that CPU. The first uh, namespace we tackled, uh, and we are working on this uh, pretty much now after the conference, uh, is the network namespace. Uh, network namespace by definition creates a, a, an isolated uh, network stack independent of, from the host names from the host network stack and from the network stacks of other namespaces. Uh, the 
objects in the network namespace are private to the, that namespace, like TCP caches, uh, IP tables, and so on. They are not needed outside the container. And uh, uh, if we, for instance, create a container that has a uh, hardware interface moved into that, uh, moved to the network space of that container, we essentially create an isolated networking stack, pretty much the same way like uh, virtual, uh, like uh, device assignment for the virtual machines. So, uh, no, it won't work. Uh, the idea is uh, to have uh, a part of the page table that's mapped inside an isolated network namespace unmapped in the kernel direct map. And uh, this way, neither host kernel nor the uh, other containers will see the objects, will have mapping for the objects uh, that are present in this area. and. Uh, they will not, won't be able to access them. Uh, there is still uh, some gap between what we have now and what we, where we need to, go to get. So the first one, uh, the, we need to add uh, more mechanism to management, mechanism to management of the kernel page tables. Uh, we need to provide a way uh, for applications, uh, for kernel services running inside uh, the isolated namespace to allocate memory on behalf of that namespace and to make this memory isolated from the rest of the system. And uh, since we are touching uh, the direct map, um, and we need to uh, preserve uh, its integrity in a way that the performance of the system won't be degraded because of uh, our manipulations on the direct map. There are several uh, related use cases that uh, need similar functionality in that way or another. It's a, first, it's a MemFD secret system call that we've added to the Linux uh, kernel uh, as of uh, 5.14. Uh, it also fragments direct memory, and uh, we need to address uh, this uh, fragmentation to make MemFD secret uh, available more than it is available now. Uh, there is an ongoing project uh, for protecting perch tables with the PK PKS, uh, and uh, they also would need some uh, mechanisms to reduce direct map fragmentation. And uh, there is a, a AMD secure nested paging, I presume TDX from Intel does similar things. When they have a memory that's private to the guest, they also need to fragment direct memory, direct map, and something should be done to avoid the fragmentation affecting system performance. So, a Kernel page tables uh, since forever, like there is only one kernel page table. We've put a lot of effort into managing user page tables. Uh, there is a lot of uh, code that does uh, various optimizations into how user page tables are handled. But this code uh, is not really accessible when one wants to do things with the kernel page tables. Kernel page tables measure a uh, are mostly accessed by simple accessors. Uh, there are no uh, mechanisms for TLB gathering and so on, etc. Another thing is that uh, APIs that allow modification of the kernel mappings and the direct map initially were designed for debug, and they are not as robust as the APIs that deal with user page tables. So to provide the facilities required for the restricted kernel address spaces, we need uh, new APIs that will be able to create and tear down uh, kernel page tables efficiently. We need uh, an APIs that, we that will allow populating uh, non-default kernel page tables, for instance, uh, the, the ranges that are excluded in one kernel page table can, can be visible in another page table. Uh, and uh, as I've mentioned several times now, uh, there is a problem of direct map fragmentation. 
which is which, and the direct map is essentially the kernel page tables that creates one-on-one -on -one mapping for the entire physical memory on 64-bit systems at least. There could be some offsets uh, if uh, there is an address space randomization enabled. But for simplicity, we can presume that every physical address has its counterpart virtual address with a particular offset. So here's an example of an x86 system with two DIMMs of 8 gigabytes. One DIMM is at physical address 0, and another memory bank is at physical address 280. zeros. So the direct map for these uh, physical memory banks will look something like that. It starts at uh, this address FF8 uh, many zeros. And uh, there is a hole that corresponds to the hole in the physical memory. And uh, another part of the virtual map will start at address uh, offset two eight zeros from the beginning of the virtual map. So for any virtual address uh, in the direct map, uh, it is enough to subtract the base address from the direct mapping to get the physical address and vice versa. Most, most uh, kernel memory allocations uh, return addresses in the direct map, uh, these uh, KMALOC alloc pages, and these are used uh, in the vast majority of cases. Now, in, on x86 systems, a direct map uh, is created using large, large pages to reduce uh, memory overhead and, more importantly, to reduce TLB pressure. So, uh, for memory layout that has uh, several gigabytes of RAM, uh, there will be some part of a direct map laid out with 4 kilobyte and 2 megabyte pages, and whenever there is enough space, there will be 1 gigabyte pages covering the virtual mappings. So uh, whenever we try to exclude some address from the direct map, we cause direct map fragmentation because this gigabyte page need to be split into 2 megabytes, and 2 megabytes need to be split into 4, four kilobytes. Uh, so essentially, instead of having one mapping uh, at uh, PUD levels that maps the entire one gigabyte, we create a bunch of two mega mappings, uh, a bunch of 4K mappings, and uh, again a bunch of two meg mappings to create the aligned page table entries. Uh, this causes certain uh, degradation of the in the performance. Uh, what uh, we measured with the system, uh, with this, uh, we've run a couple of benchmarks uh, that are more, more sensitive to page table alignment and to page table uh, layout. Uh, we've tested how this will behave on uh, SSD and on TempFS. And uh, another parameter we added to the test is uh, the mitigations for hardware vulnerability such as Spectre and uh, Meltdown. And uh, what we've got is uh, four, four cases uh, uh, presenting the results. And uh, as we can see, there is indeed a performance degradation in most cases for the 4K pages. Two megabyte pages and one gigabyte pages on average perform uh, very similarly, at least on this system. Uh, and uh, while, uh, while there is performance degradation, it's not the end of the world. Uh, it, uh, it always below 10%, and in, ma in many cases, it's, uh, one, it's one digit percent uh, of the degradation. So while we should do something about uh, the direct map fragmentation, uh, it uh, still uh, doesn't uh, justify a uh, huge complexity of the proposed implementation. So uh, there were a couple of suggestions uh, how to address this. Uh, uh, the more or less there is a consensus that we need some cache of uh, two megabyte pages. That, so that it, this cache can be used to provide 4K pages for users that need uh, memory excluded from the direct map. Uh, and so whenever there is an allocation request that requires uh, unmapped memory, let's call it, uh, we allocate to megabyte page. 
uh, we split this page to four kilobyte chunks, and then uh, subsequent allocation requests of unmapped four keys uh, 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 as a subsequent prefer allocations of four keys are actually allocated from that cache. And if uh, if the memory in the page allocator fragmented, uh, too fragmented to have uh, continuous chunks of two megabytes, we just fall back to normal allocations of 4K and we can live with that, uh, the direct map will be fragmented in that areas. Uh, there were two ways uh, uh, to implement such cache. Uh, first is to implement a cache for each user of unmapped memory. And another suggestion was to implement a such cache as an extension for the page allocator. Uh, each of the approaches has its own uh, pros and cons. Uh, so per user caches are probably simpler to implement. Uh, they have better access control because the user actually knows what the memory will be used for and uh, they may do uh, various uh, optimizations like, for instance, compaction of the cache uh, to move all the used page into sing all the used pages into a single two megabyte chunk, and then release a free two megabyte chunk uh, to the rest of the system. Uh, from the other side, they would have larger memory of head than the extension to the page allocator. At least some initial experiments we've done uh, show that. And uh, there will be overall higher fragmentation of the memory in the system. And, and uh, the pros and cons of the other approach is pretty much inverse of the first. It's more intrusive changes. The cache is a black box, so it would be hard to move pages around inside the cache because a page allocator would not know what are they destined for and how their access rights can be changed on the fly. It will be more memory efficient with lower overall memory, <laughs> with overall lower memory fragmentation, and uh, uh, the core mem integration will provide uh, a, an easier pass for free in memory, which is uh, which is uh, as I found out in hard way, it's much more difficult to to realize that uh, allocation. Because when you do an allocation of memory, you know what context are you in, and uh, it's pretty much streamlined. When you freeze a memory, in many cases, you need to understand what particular cache it should be freed to. So um, our idea is to add the awareness uh, of the direct map to page allocator. Uh, for now, we call it, uh, and we created a new G get free page flag. We call it GFP exclusive. So any allocation that uh, adds a GFP exclusive to its uh, GFP flags will receive a page that uh, excluded from the direct memory. Uh, and uh, since it will be extension to the page allocator, the free page and the, its companion functions will know how to put the page into the appropriate cache and how to release it in the way so that it won't be put in the global free list and they won't cause additional fragmentation of the direct memory. We are planning on creating a shrinker to free unused part of the caches when there is a memory pressure. And there is also possibility to create some cache defragmentation, probably with callbacks to the users to allow uh, changes of uh, the permissions of particular pages. Next thing is uh, moving up on the allocation stack. Uh, we need to extend the slab allocators. Uh, again, we call the slab exclusive. So whenever uh, somebody creates a KMM cache with KMM, KMM cache create, they can pass a slab exclusive and uh, then the cache will be entirely excluded from the direct map. The objects in that cache will, won't be visible in the default uh, in the default page tables. And the the idea is to reuse uh, the mechanism C groups used up until recently. Whenever there is a 
request for such private cash, uh, we create a child cash of the uh, of the original KMM cash, and this cash serves as a pool of uh, memory for the context that requires private memory allocations. And uh, whenever we free uh, memory in such a uh, cache, we, we add the metadata to the cache or to the struct page that represents uh, some of the uh, metadata of the SMAP caches. So K3 can look, look up that metadata and understand what context uses uh, the memory and uh, to free it into the appropriate cache. Yeah. Sorry. As I said, freeing memory that is, uh, that is restricted to a particular context is more difficult than allocating it. Uh, for instance, uh, things like RCU, software queue, and so on uh, usually run in entirely different contexts that we wanted them to, uh, on different contexts that allocated memory. So we need some metadata to address this and to be able to um, to create to to to, to detect from the freed address what uh, what is the context and what is the cache that the memory should be freed to. After we implemented uh, these uh, two extensions to the memory allocator, uh, uh, we need to adjust the networking next networking stack to use these uh, methods to hide the networking objects. So uh, we are adding a, a page table or even an entire MM struct to the network namespace uh, representation, which is a uh, struct net namespace. And then we can start switching a KMM cache users inside the, the networking stack to use a slab exclusive or GFP exclusive, depending on the context. And uh, some, some of the networking stack uh, functionality requires, uh, requires minor adjustments because uh, things like timers and software queue processing run in, always run in the default context. So we need an ability to map things back and forth or to switch context whenever it is needed. And it's a uh, kind of the vision picture where we where we would like to get uh, after all this uh, will work so uh, as of today uh, there is a vmx isolation for virtual machines uh, you can assign a virtual inter virtual function to to a vm uh, and uh, this creates a, an isolated networking stack uh, for the virtual machines uh, what we are trying to achieve with the MMU isolation and with the restricted kernel address spaces is the creation of very similar uh, network isolation for the containers so that a virtual function uh, can be assigned to a container uh, and the, the entire networking stack of that container will run in a different address space than the default address space of the system. And so MMU will guarantee that uh, no other containers can access uh, the data that passes in that, virtual, uh, in that uh, networking stack. We actually did some proof of concept implementation of uh, the whole thing. Uh, and we, it was stable enough to run some benchmarks uh, between uh, reboots, of course. Uh, we, we've tested uh, Memcached, Apache, Nginx, and the iperf uh, to see if there is a if there is a significant performance degradation caused by the isolation we've created. Uh, so there were three variants we, we checked. It was a unmodified baseline, like the normal networking stack of the Linux kernel. Uh, we checked our implementation, which is uh, the isolated network namespace. And we also uh, did uh, test uh, the, uh, this configuration on virtual machine with the uh, assigned, uh, assigned networking interface using PCI pass-through. 
So uh, as you can see, we are better than VM, right? There is slight performance degradation relatively to the native uh, Linux kernel stack, uh, but uh, VM with uh, VF assignment worked uh, worked uh, less efficient in uh, all the use cases. And I think I talked too fast, or I had too little slides. Anyway, uh, to conclude, uh, restricted other spaces uh, for network namespace creates the isolation of the networking stack uh, similar to what uh, virtual machines have, and it is better in terms of performance. Uh, Caching of large pages removed from the direct map is essential for particularly any security features that uses memory management for security, and uh, it's important to, to have this, otherwise uh, we'll have a performance degradation of the entire system. And uh, another point is that uh, reworking kernel address space management is a major challenge. Uh, probably not as major as real-time Linux, and it, we hope it will take less than 20 years to achieve. Thank you. Questions? I did uh, brute force, like, uh, uh, the question was what testing have we done to verify that uh, network, na network namespace, uh, address space indeed isolates something, right? So I did a brute force test, kind of. I created a dedicated kernel model uh, with IOCTLs that allowed me to try different, to access different memory inside the machine. Uh, and uh, I just seen that I cannot access uh, this memory. I, I didn't do penetration tests and so on, but uh, I verify it is indeed excluded, and I can verify that uh, an attacker would need to rebuild page table to access these areas. Yes? Uh, we didn't finish with network namespace. Yes, it's not upstream. Hey, uh, sorry, the question was, what's uh, the next namespace to tackle? Probably mount, or user, or any other of eight of them. No, it'll take a while until we finish with the network namespace, so we will wait on that. really hard to tell uh, because like <laughs> sorry uh, the question was uh, we didn't submit it yet to the upstream where what are the plans about going upstream so if we get back to this slide uh, these are kind of prerequests to start actually doing things to the network namespace memory management so before we have uh, at least a direct map and the page allocator uh, done, uh, we cannot really start changing how network namespace allocates and freeze memory. Uh, yes, and uh, there was an RFC from uh, people who work on the PKS about uh, using uh, their user caches for their use case uh, a while ago, and I've sent an RFC uh, to create a page allocator extension to address uh, the direct map fragmentation problem. So uh, this is worked on these days, and th this is going to be upstream first, I presume. Any more questions? <laughs> 
let's go back to the last slide. Thank you very much.